Good afternoon. My name is Colleen Brock and I am the Program Manager of Education for the Immune Deficiency Foundation. Thank you for joining us. Before we start today's session, I'd like to go over a few reminders. First, please remember that each patient's treatment and condition is unique. The content presented in this session should not be used as a substitute for professional medical advice. In all cases, patients and caregivers should consult their health care providers. Also, remember that where you are on your journey of living with primary immunodeficiency may differ from that of others in the community. The severity of primary immunodeficiency can vary, and we ask that you are supportive and respectful of one another as fellow members of the IDF community. Questions will be answered at the end of the presenter's talk. Please submit your questions in the question box located at the bottom of your screen. The presenter will answer as many questions as possible during that time. Now it is my pleasure to welcome you to our breakout session, Understanding Immunological Testing. What do my lab tests really mean? This session will be presented by Dr. McNamara. Dr. McNamara is a staff physician at the Cleveland Clinic Foundation in the Center for Pediatric Allergy and Immunology and an assistant professor of pediatrics at Case Western Reserve <laughs> University. Dr. McNamara is board certified in pediatrics and allergy and immunology. Her clinical interests are broad and she enjoys caring for patients with aller allergic conditions as well as immunodeficiency. And we'll now turn things over to Dr. McNamara. Welcome. Thank you so much. I'm very happy to be here with you guys this afternoon. And as we mentioned, we're discussing understanding immunological testing. I have no relevant disclosures to this talk this afternoon. So while we will touch on a number of immunodeficiency conditions and some treatments for immunodeficiency. The primary focus of this talk will really be about the laboratory tests that are utilized when diagnosing immunodeficiency conditions. So one of the basic com concepts that is very important when considering any laboratory test is the definition of normal. Generally, the normal value for a lab test is determined by obtaining samples from a large number of healthy individuals. Many tests will show some variation even among healthy people, so the normal result is often presented as a range. Many laboratories will label this the reference range. There are certain factors that can influence the normal values of these tests. In, in particular, one is age. So when immunologists or other physicians order any laboratory test, they really need to consider these types of factors and really help them to decide whether that reported reference range is accurate or expected for that particular individual. There are many different laboratory tests that are utilized to evaluate the immune system. An immunologist will use a person's history or their story to help determine which part of the immune system they think might not be working. Then the immunologist can order tests that specifically look at that part of the immune system. So the first part of the immune system and the type of tests we will discuss are those that evaluate the humoral immune system. The humoral immune system is a part of the body's adaptive immune system. So it's the part that uses antibodies to help fight infections like bacteria and viruses. The most common immunodeficiencies are problems with antibodies. So we'll spend the most time here this afternoon. Because this kind of humoral immunodeficiency is a problem with antibodies, the first test that immunologists will often use is checking the antibody levels. These are also called immunoglobulin. So you might hear antibody levels or immunoglobulin levels. There are different classes of immunoglobulins in the body. This includes IgG, IgA, IgM, and IgE. Each class of antibody has a little bit of a different role in the body. Um, IgG is the antibody that has the highest levels in the blood, whereas IgA, for instance, helps protect a lot of the mucosal surfaces, so the respiratory tract and the gut. These antibody levels are often low in immunodeficiency conditions. However, there, there are some primary immunodeficiencies where the levels can actually be high. We know that a lot of immunodeficiency um, conditions and, and complications are because of the body not being able to fight off infections. 
But there are many immunodeficiencies that can actually have also autoimmune disease or times where the immune system is just misbehaving or not regulated appropriately. So those are some of the instances where you can actually see high levels of antibodies. And while it is important to know what these levels are, the other part that is really important is how well the antibody is working or the function. So you can think about it in terms of quality and being more important than quantity. For example, there are many people that can walk around with a low IG, IgG level, but if that IgG that is there is working really well, then it might be sufficient to protect the person from infections and they might live a very normal life. So for that reason, in order to evaluate Evaluate the antibody function, immunologists have additional tests that are available. Uh, then, in particular, this is called antibody titers. So, antibodies protect against specific bacteria and viruses, and when you check a level to one of those specific infections, that's looking at an antibody titer. And you make antibodies to these specific bacteria and viruses in two separate ways. Number one, if you receive a vaccine, and number two, if you encounter that infection just in normal daily life and become ill, your body makes antibodies to protect you in the future. So one of the ways that we kind of look at the function of the antibodies is with titers to certain bacteria that have um, been part of routine vaccines. So for instance, Diphtheria and tetanus are included in several vaccines, including DTaP and DTaP or Tdap. Um, and then pneumococcus is a specific bacteria that causes a lot of infections of the respiratory tract. So it's a common cause of sinus infections and pneumonia. There's actually several kinds of vaccines for pneumococcus. There's the Prevnar, which is a routine part of the childhood series of vaccines. And then there's also a vaccine called Pneumovax. This is one that's typically given to older adults, but it can be given to other people with um, certain underlying conditions such as heart disease, lung disease, or immunodeficiency if they're at particularly high risk for infection with this bacteria. So immunologists can look at the titers to each of these to see if the antibodies are working by determining did your body make antibodies after you received the vaccine. The body does respond a little bit differently to different types of vaccines. So for instance, diphtheria and tetanus are both what we call conjugated vaccines, and it uses a combination of different parts of the immune system to create a response. The pneumovax in particular is what we call a polysaccharide vaccine. So that really only uses the humoral part of the immune system and no others to make the protective antibodies. So for that reason, it's very common when immunologists are evaluating for an an antibody problem for them to check antibody titers before and then again after someone receives a pneumovax to see how well those antibodies are working. So there are tests also available to look at the number of immune cells. For the humoral immune system specifically, there are tests available to look at the number of B cells, which are also called B lymphocytes. These are the cells that make the antibodies. There are different subsets of B, or subsets of B cells, and there are tests available to look at those specific numbers as well. And this test isn't often needed for an initial diagnosis of specific immunodeficiency, but it can sometimes provide helpful information or even prognostic information. So how well a person's going to do with a specific condition. As an example, patients in common variable immunodeficiency or CVID have antibody problems. And some studies show that if the patients with this condition have low memory B cells or one of those specific subsets, then they're more likely to have certain complications such as autoimmune disease or in a large spleen. So sometimes even if it was important making the initial diagnosis, these kinds of tests can give us that additional information. So as many of you may be aware, one of the main treatments for antibody deficiencies is antibody or immunoglobulin replacement. 
And there are a large number of products available for this treatment now, but it can be administered either IV, which is often referred to as IVIG, or subcutaneously, which is just under the skin. Immunoglobulin replacement therapy is prepared by collecting blood from a large number of healthy people. The idea being that we take antibodies from those people and give it to people who can't produce the antibodies on their own. So the number of donors that contribute to a single dose of IVIG or subcutaneous IVIG is often 10,000 or greater. So that way, one individual dose contains a very broad range of antibodies to a lot of different bacteria and viruses that are commonly encountered. However, what needs to be kept in mind is that if you check antibody titers while someone's receiving this treatment, you're going, to be re you're going to really be checking the level of the antibodies coming in the treatment rather than what that person's own body is making. So it can be really hard to determine exactly how the humoral immune system is working if someone's already on this treatment. If that kind of evaluation is really necessary, there's a couple options. Number one, you might be able to stop the treatment for some time. It usually takes a number of months and then check the antibody titers. But sometimes that's not a safe option if there's such a high risk of infection. The other option is to use a vaccine to something that's not normally encountered in the environment. So for example, we don't expect people to have ever been infected with rabies or to have received a rabies vaccine. So for that reason, the rabies antibodies are not going to be in that sample of immunoglobulin. So someone will not be getting rabies antibodies in their treatment. So if you need to know how the humoral immune system is functioning while on IVIG, you could give a rabies vaccine and then check antibody titers for that specifically. A similar consideration needs to be taken into account if a person is being tested to see if they have a specific infection while on treatment with immunoglobulin replacement. Some tests for infection use serology, which is really antibody titers, to look for evidence of infection. This is common in some viruses, such as EBV or Epstein-Barr virus, where typically you would look at levels of IgG and IgM against EBV. So again, if someone's already on humoral um, or on immunoglobulin replacement therapy, then those tests won't be reliable during the treatment and you would have to think about other options for evaluation. So now we'll move away from the humoral immune system and move on to cellular immunity. Cellular, cellular immunity is another part of the adaptive immune system and it's primarily driven by T cells or T lymphocytes. And there are just like B cells, different kinds of T cells in the body and they have different actions. So there are some T cells that help B cells to function. These are called appropriately helper T cells. There are some T cells that kill germs like viruses directly. We call these cytotoxic T cells. And there are some T cells that regulate other parts of the immune system or regulatory T cells. So there is one test um, for T cells or cellular immunity now actually checked automatically at birth. This is called TREX. And as of 2018, it's been a part of the newborn screen in all 50 states in the US. So this test is important because in particular, it helps identify a condition called SCID or severe combined immunodeficiency at a very early point. This is important because SCID is a um, rare but very serious condition where the T cells are absent. So it puts the person at risk for very severe infections as well as other complications. And it's fatal at a very young age if not treated appropriately. So we can look for this by looking for TREX. TREX are little DNA pieces that are created when T cells are developing. So in babies that do not have T cells, they would have no TREX. So you can pick that up right away within the first few days of life. Outside of the newborn period, if the immunologist is worried about the cellular immune system, the first test that they would usually check is a CBC or a complete blood count. This includes the number of total white blood cells in the, more, in the body, which is a bunch of different um, types of immune cells. 
And one of the numbers it gives specifically is lymphocytes, which is the T and B cells combined. So to look more specifically at the T cells, there can be tests ordered to check the number of each kind of T cells, so those helper T cells, cytotoxic T cells. And this is accomplished by a test called flow cytometry. In this test, you obtain a blood sample, and this is analyzed by a machine that looks for specific uh, molecules on the surface of white blood cells to identify what kind of white blood cell it is and then count it. So this can give you the number or quantity of T cells. When considering the cellular immune system, just like the humoral immune system, both quantity however, with T cells in particular, if either one is abnormal, it can increase the risk for infections. So to check how T cells are functioning, there is a test called a proliferation assay. And in this, a blood sample is obtained and the lymphocytes, so those T and B cells are separated out. And then they're put in a sample and something called mitogens is added to it. Mitogens are molecules that just activate T cells. So in the presence of mitogens, normally T cells would proliferate or increase in number. So after a set number of days, the lab technician will go back and count the T cells. And if someone has T cells that are working properly after coming into contact with those mitogens, there should be very high numbers. So that helps you know whether the, the T cells that are there are functioning properly. There are some drawbacks to this test. It does take a little bit of time, um, as you can imply from the methods, and it also takes quite a bit of blood um, to run this test, which is something in particular to, count, to consider if um, you're drawing the test on a small baby. So now we're moving on to yet another part of the immune system, and we're going to talk about phagocytes. So phagocytes are a part of the innate immune system, and the innate immune system is that part that works really fast right when an infection or a germ first appears. It, um, and this part has a few different kinds of white blood cells, but in particular, there's one called neutrophils. So phagocytes ingest the germs like bacteria, which you can see in this image of a white blood cell engulfing those green bacteria. And since it is one of the kinds of white blood cells, again, we can go back to the CBC and start by looking at the number of neutrophils. There are some immunodeficiency where the number of neutrophils is just low, such as a condition called congenital neutropenia. And you may recognize the theme here, but again, you can also look at the function, not only the numbers, to evaluate phagocytes. Phagocytes in particular use a process called oxidative burst to kill germs. So there are tests available to see if that process is working. This looks for a condition specifically called CGD, or chronic granulomatous disease. So there's an older test um, that we don't use as much now um, called NBT, or the nitro blue tetrazoleum test. And this was a dye test where you look for a color change to see if that oxidative burst is working. Now there's a more updated test called the DHR or dihydrorhodamine test. And this is just a little bit better at picking up this same condition. And it does have some added benefits as well because it can actually pick up carriers of the disease in addition to people that have the condition themselves. There are immunodeficiency caused by other problems with phagocytes. So we talked about neutrophils a little bit already, but there's one condition called LAD or leukocyte adhesion, adhesion deficiency, where neutrophils are missing molecules on the surface that help them go to sites of infection in the body. So if they're missing those molecules, they get stuck in the blood vessels, and then they can't get out to parts of the body like the skin or the mouth to help, help fight infections there. And this is yet another use for flow cytometry because you can look to see if those molecules are there on the surface or not. So there's one other type of cell um, that's a part of the innate immune system, and that is the natural killer cell. These cells are another type of cell that just kills germs directly, and a deficiency and this kind of cell can cause problems with infections and specifically um, with herpes viruses because the NK cell helps, per, helps fight and protect the body against this kind of germ.
So when you use that flow cytometry to look at either T or B cell numbers, you typically also get a result for the NK cell numbers. And here it is again, you also can look not only at the numbers, but at the function of the NK cells. So there is a separate test available for NK cell function. That brings us then to complement. So this is another part of the immune system that helps or complements the function of the antibodies, thus the name. And complement has a variety of functions in the body, but one of which is poking holes in the surface of bacteria, which you can see in this image here, so that it destroys the bacteria. People with complement deficiencies can have trouble fighting off specific infections, in particular um, a species of bacteria called Neisseria, which is one of the main causes of meningitis. And there's a whole set of molecules that make up this system. It's a pretty rare um, immune system. Is working. Um, there's a test called CH50. If that's normal, that tells us the complement system is working well. If it's abnormal, then there are additional tests available to narrow down the diagnosis. So there's something called an AH50 that measures part of the pathway. And then you can also look at individual levels of the complement molecules. And a lot of these are named C with the following number. So you can look at a C3 level or a C4 level, for instance. So finally, this brings us to genetic testing. An entire talk really could be devoted to this topic alone, so we're just gonna be touching on the main points here. Genetic testing has significantly advanced over the years, and now there are quite a few forms available. Um, it is not often used as a first step. There are still limitations, and it can be quite expensive at times. So a lot of times immunologists will use all those other tests that we've been discussing to help initially establish a diagnosis or at least narrow down a diagnosis. But genetic testing can be helpful in either confirming a diagnosis that was suspected based on earlier results or in identifying a diagnosis in particularly complex cases where you haven't been able to identify the exact cause with all the other tests available. There are different tools available for genetic testing. One of them is the microarray. So this is a relatively quick test, and it looks mainly for major changes in the chromosome. So either a added chromosome or an added piece, or conversely, a, a missing piece or a missing chromosome. So for instance, it can detect conditions such as the George syndrome, where there's a deletion in part of chromosome 22. However, that kind of test does not look for very small changes in the DNA or in particular like changes in a single gene. So for those, you would either look at a specific gene test or the whole genome. If you're looking for specific genes, there's two options. If the immunologist has a very strong suspicion and a good idea of exactly what the diagnosis is, you may just be able to order a specific test. If you're not sure or if you're helping to confirm or maybe get more information about a given condition, there are also a lot of panels available where there's a whole group of genes that we know can play a role in immunodeficiencies and you may look at that panel. So for instance, we know that common variable immunodeficiency, CVID, can be caused by a number of different genetic mutations, and sometimes we can't even find the specific genetic cause, but there are panels available with some of the most common mutations in CVID, so you can order that CVID panel to see if any of the genes are mutated. So finally, if the immunologist does not really have a good idea because the case is particularly complex, they can order whole genome sequencing. This is nice in a way because it gives you a lot of information, but you have to keep in mind that it's important to know how to interpret that information. So right now, physicians and scientists do not have know the exact cause or exact role of each gene in the body. And the whole genome sequencing looks at all the person's DNA that codes for proteins. We call it coding DNA. So when someone is ordering a whole genome sequence, then they are going to get back information about any points in the DNA that are unusual, 
Sometimes this used to be called mutation. It's moving more towards terminology where we call that a variation or a variant. And depending on what we know about the gene that has the variant, we can determine if it might be the cause or is likely not the cause or we're not sure. So for instance, if a whole genome sequence comes back and there was an abnormal gene and we know that gene has caused conditions or immunodeficiencies in other patients in the past and it seems to fit with what we were looking for, then a lot of times the reading will come back, this is a variant that is likely pathogenic, meaning most likely this is the explanation for symptoms. On the other hand, we know there's some variations that have been proven to be um, present in normal, healthy people. So if there's one of those variations and it doesn't really fit with the reason that we were looking for a abnormal gene, then it might come back a variation that's likely benign, likely doesn't explain things. And then finally, you may get a reading that says it's a genetic or a, a genetic variance of undetermined significance, meaning we might not know what the role of that specific gene is, so we aren't sure whether that's causing the symptoms or not. So it's a lot of information, and like I said, this could be a whole topic on its own, but genetic testing is being utilized more and more often during the evaluation of primary immunodeficiencies. So that concludes my talk this afternoon. Um, here are the resources that I utilize today. And if anyone is looking for um, further reading, in particular, the IDF handbook for patients and families does have a lot of information about some of the testing and things that we discussed this afternoon. So with that, I would like to thank everyone, including the organizers here today for allowing me to speak and I will be happy to take any questions. All right, thank you very much, Dr. McNamara. That was a wonderful presentation. So we're gonna start with some questions. First one is, as an adult with CVID, my doctor has me get the Pneumovax every five years and also received the Prevnar one time. At what age should my three-year-old daughters with CVID start that regimen? Wondering if it would be right at 18 or when to plan for that to happen. So there's probably no specific answer to that question, unfortunately. Um, I mentioned that the Pneumovax is sometimes indicated for people that have immunodeficiency or other um, kind of reasons that they're at increased risk. Um, that being said, the Prevnar, um, because it is, like I mentioned, a conjugated vaccine, it's at actually a little bit better at stimulating the immune system and developing those protective antibodies against the pneumococcus, so it might be sufficient while they were young. So there's probably not a specific recommendation, um, and it's something to definitely speak with their immunologist about. Um, but overall, I, I think that while they're very young and the Prevnar has been a recent part of their vaccine schedule, it might give them enough protection for a little while. Great, thank you. Can the T-cell tests like pl proliferation assay with mitogens be done while on IgG? And if so, are they as accurate? Yes, so this is one immuno immunologic test that is not affected by IVIG. Um, the ones that deal more with the antibodies are affected for all the reasons that we discussed, um, but the proliferation assays will not be affected. So that test can still be obtained on immunoglobulin replacement and really the results will not be impacted by that. Perfect. What does it mean if the CH50 is chronically extremely elevated? So that is a little tricky to know for sure without um, knowing more specifics about what's going on. Um, the good thing is it is it is less concerning to me than a low CH50. Um, like I was discussing, the, the low CH50 would indicate that the complement system is not working. Um, so that would be concerning for a deficiency where you're at risk for infection. Being on the high side would not say it would not 
create a risk for infection. Um, it could be elevated for a variety of reasons. Sometimes it's um, due to something like auto underlying autoimmune disease. Um, so it doesn't give me one specific diagnosis or one specific concern. And uh, your doctor would really need to kind of think about what else and what other symptoms are going on and therefore kind of what else to look for. Thank you. So I have another question here. I have PID and also low T and B cells. My T and B cells were finally normal, but my percentage of NK cells, CD5616, is now high. What does this mean? None of my doctors know. <laughs> that is another great question. So this is this is another instance where where high is sometimes less concerning than low. Um, we know that in amino, some immunodeficiencies, there, there is this immune dysregulation where it's not always just that the immune system isn't working enough. Sometimes it's working inappropriately. So the NK cells being high could be a little bit of a reflection of that. Um, I don't, I don't anticipate that that would cause any specific uh, symptoms or complications, um, but it could be that reflection. I would also wonder if it's the actual number or the percentage. So when you look at the results of those flow cytometry tests and it tells you the numbers of the T cells, B cells, and K cells, it gives you the absolute number for each of those and then it also gives percentage so in this case if the nk cell percentage is high it might simply be because that when there's less t and b cells then automatically the percent overall of nk cells is higher which that would be less concerning if it's the actual number of NK cells, that's where it gets a little bit more tricky. And like I said, again, I don't think there's any specific complication I would worry about. Um, it hasn't, to my knowledge, ever been associated with any particular infections or, or complications. Um, so I don't know that I have a perfect answer either, but just some, some thoughts there. <laughs> Thank you. So talking about low, are there any treatments for when T cells are low? So not, not in the same way that there are treatments for antibodies. So in cases where the defect with T cells is very severe. Um, so for instance, severe combined immunodeficiency or other conditions where the T cells are, are almost absent. Um, some of those will be treated very early on with stem cell transplant. So typically like a bone marrow transplant. Um, that's really the only way that you can like give back T cells per se. Um, for some of the other conditions where it's a more mild form of a T cell immunodeficiency um, and, and bone marrow transplantation or stem cell transplantation is, is too extreme, then there's unfortunately no way to specifically like replace. Um, so a lot of times the treatment involves just giving antibiotics to protect against certain infections that are more common if your T cells are low. So in particular, there's certain um, bacteria, we call them opportunistic bacteria that don't usually cause infections in healthy people, but can cause infections in people that have low T cells and similar um, with certain funguses. So if you can't, when you can't really replace the T cells in any way, sometimes you would just need to watch that number. And if it drops below a certain level, then you start those antibiotics on a prophylaxis ba prophylactic basis to protect against those infections. Thank you. Would quote unquote normal non-PI people normally have antibodies to pneumococci and streptococci, et cetera? 
Yes, and that's the whole idea behind immunoglobulin replacement is that most people are going to have developed, developed a variety of antibodies to, um, to not only pneumococcus, streptococcus, but a wide variety of bacteria and viruses through those two mechanisms we mentioned, either by getting a vaccine or by having an infection, encountering the virus or bacteria and fighting it off. So when healthy people develop all those antibodies, you will see them if you check titers. And then again, that's the whole idea behind immunoglobulin replacement is you take those antibodies from the normal healthy people and you give them to people that can't make them themselves. So yes, you will see that. And on that note, we have a question. I have CBID, I'm on sub-Q therapy, whereby my IG levels are now within the normal range. What does this mean exactly when it comes to infections? Am I considered like a normal person or is being artificially normal not the same ability to fight bugs and infections and viruses and things like that? So that's a great question. We know that if we keep the immunoglobulin levels above a certain threshold, and they've looked at different thresholds um, in the literature over, over many years, but generally speaking, if we keep it in a normal or near normal range, it will significantly decrease the chance of serious infections. So that means it decreases the chance of things like a pneumonia or a very unusual infection or bacteria in the blood, things like that. So it helps protect against those severe infections and decreases the risk. Um, that being said, I mean, there's still the risk for kind of the more common colds and, and things that get passed around. And whether you're really ever truly at a, at a normal kind of healthy level is, is definitely a little bit of a question mark. Um, it seems to vary depending on how severe the disease is. So I know I've seen some CVID patients where when they are on immunoglobulin replacement, they are happy, healthy, and kind of soaring, and others who still do tend to get some infections. And sometimes they need either a little bit increase in dose or other adjustments to their treatment to really um, get that protection. So I, I would I would say overall, the answer is sometimes yes and sometimes no. It really depends on, on a case-by-case -case basis. And it's hard to really predict that based on just numbers. Um, a lot of times, it's something that you and your, your immunologist learn over time while managing your case. Thank you. Mm -hmm. The mutations you were talking about, are these mutations generally germline and or somatic mutations? So, uh, like, it's just that you're picking up on the testing is generally the, the germline mutations. Where does the risk of lymphoma come in, come from in CVID? Does getting IgG treatment mitigate this cancer risk long term? So, I don't... It's not fully understood why um, that risk is present. Um, there's definitely a variety of complicated theories out there, um, but it goes back to kind of in a, in a simple manner that not only do you have your immune system not working well, but there is some immune dysregulation and probably some of the normal kind of regulatory measures and, and kind of checkpoints that most immune cells are subject to can get thrown off in primary immunodeficiency. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't seem like the immunoglobulin replacement really protects against that. Um, the immunoglobulin replacement has um, been shown mostly just to protect against the infection portion um, rather than any of the autoimmune or the lymphoma complications. So unfortunately, a lot of times that means those other complications, you simply have to monitor for them and undergo kind of surveillance as recommended by your doctor. And then sometimes if you have a autoimmune condition or a lymphoma pop up, you just have to treat that separately. 
Okay, next one. I was told I have hypogamma globulinemia due to IgG tests. No other genetic tests have been done. I have symptoms. My plasma infusions don't seem to help. What testing would you recommend? So I would first want to know kind of what evaluation of the antibodies they've done so far. So hypoglobulin, hypoglobulin, Globulinemia tells me that the levels are low, but I would be interested to know, did anyone do that antibody testing to look how the antibodies are functioning? Um, that would be one major part. And like we talked about, that that's hard to do while you're already on the treatment. So it would be interesting to know if it's ever been done before. And if it hasn't, that would have to be a consideration of how how much do we need this information if you're already receiving the treatment because antibody titers on the treatment aren't going to give you reliable information um the other consideration could be to look at kind of going back to what we talked about with the humoral immune test is looking at the different kinds of B cells. So like I mentioned, it doesn't really give you a specific diagnosis per se, but it can give you a little bit more information about risk um, for the future, knowing kind of what those levels of B cells are. And then finally, de depending on the case, it's not always used, but there could be um, some genetic tests obtained in, in particular for ones that we know go along with CVID, since one of the more common reasons for hypogammaglobulinemia is CVID. Um, and I think after getting a little bit more of that information, it can help kind of guide treatment in the future. And perhaps if, if the infusions aren't helping, then that information could help decide, well, is it is it not working because this is isn't the best option, or maybe the dose needs adjusted, something like that. Thank you. Is there an absolute IgG level that means you cannot have CVID, meaning this IgG level is too high to be diagnosed with CVID? So it would have to be, so the reference range is a little bit different based on individual labs. Um, generally speaking, it's a little over 600 would be considered normal. And to fit a diagnosis of CVID, you actually have to have multiple things. So number one is a low IgG, but then you also need to have evidence of a low IgA or IgM or both. And then in addition to the levels, it goes back again to function. So there needs to be evidence that those levels are not working. There are some cases where the IgG level is normal, which means it wouldn't fit a diagnosis of CVID, but the levels are low, so those antibody titers are low. So in that case, it would be an instance where the quantity is okay, but the antibodies aren't working. Since that doesn't fit CVID, it actually fits into another category. So we call that um, specific antibody deficiency with normal immunoglobulin levels, or sometimes it's abbreviated SANDI, S-A-N-D-I. So it's still another um, indication for immunoglobulin replacement. Um, sometimes if you're having a lot of trouble with infections because the antibodies aren't working, it just ends up being a different um, diagnosis than CVID. Thanks. So another question has to do with the pneumonia vaccine, specifically the Pneumovax. And I have also heard this. Is it possible with either one to receive it multiple times? This person got it, got it again, and then was told never to get it again. So is it possible to have those vaccines multiple times? And why would you do that? Yes, so there is an indication. Um, you know what, I, I manage more pediatric patients, so I'm not as familiar with the adult literature, um, but after um, age 65, there is a recommendation regarding um, the initial Pneumovax dose and then sub subsequent dosing, and I've lost track of this specific interval, how often you give it. Like I said, I'm too much feeds, um, but there, there are indications for boosters, and similarly, like the Prevnar, we give multiple doses in childhood. 
Um, so sometimes uh, antibody and protective titers can just wane and kind of gradually drop over time. So there is sometimes reason to give those vaccines again. And, and typically there are, there are specific recommendations out there that your doctor can follow. Well, thank you very much. Unfortunately, our time has come to an end as this session ends at 4.15. So please join me in thanking Dr. McNamara for being here today and your wonderful presentation. And I wish all of you a wonderful summit. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you.